I'm pleased to introduce Stephanie Hyde, <coughs> current president of the USATF, the organization which represents all U.S. male and female track athletes, who will speak today on the power of standing alone. A track star at the Ohio State University, she earned titles from the Big Ten Conference, the NCAA, and other national championships in the 60-meter dash, 60-meter hurdles, and the 100-meter hurdles, events for which she did not lose a single race from 1977 through 1980. After retiring from competition, she's held several positions within the USATF, including the women's team manager at the 2004 Athens Olympic Games. In addition to her work in athletics, Stephanie has engaged in a variety of philanthropic and community projects in her home city of Columbus, Ohio. She is currently the Vice President for Institutional Advancement at the Columbus College of Art and Design, has served in the Columbus Mayor's Cabinet for Sports Development, and she is the first woman ever to serve as the President and CEO of the Columbus Urban League. When I first met Stephanie a few years ago, she told me a story about how when she was a freshman at Ohio State, her track coach drove the entire women's team out into the middle of nowhere. They had no idea where they were. It was at night. He asked them to get out of the van and then told them that they had to run back to campus as quickly, quickly as they were able. He got back in the van and drove off, leaving them in the dark. When she got back to campus, finally, she phoned her father, and she said, I'm done. I cannot compete for this man. And he said, you've never been a quitter, and you're not going to be a quitter now. You just have to find a way. Stephanie Hightower, quite simply, has successfully been finding her way in both her professional and personal lives ever since. And she does so with certain characteristics, honesty, and I have to admit, she can be brutally forthright at times. And tenacity, the truth of it is, her special brand of toughness is always measured with compassion and kindness. And that's why, for all of her many professional accomplishments and for who she is as a woman and a friend, I'm delighted that she agreed to be with us here today. So please, help me welcome Stephanie Knight. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, you guys are asleep? No. Good afternoon. I'm going to try this again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> there we go. Uh, thank you, uh, Karen, for that warm and that kind introduction. Um, it's uh, not often that you get to be away from home and um, know someone for um, a short period of time, but, but feel like you've known them for a long time. So thank you, uh, Karen, for that kind introduction. I would first like to say thank you to the leadership um, in the Africana Women's Gender Studies and Athletic Departments for co-sponsoring me to be here today and for inviting me to share my thoughts at this prestigious uh, institution. Now before I start, um, I have to give a shout out to my track and field family here at Villanova. Um, you have a long history of excellence <coughs> in the sport of track and field and that is very impressive. Um, I just met a uh, women's head coach. Where did she go? Right here in the back. And um, you have an impressive cross-country program that's strong and achieved national uh, collegiate honors. And you have a recent um, national collegiate champion, Sheila Reed. Is Sheila here today? She's probably out running someplace, probably. <laughs> <coughs> and I hope she is. Um, but I just wanted to say congratulations um, to um, your great program and to say wow. So let's give my track and field family a round of applause. <laughs> um, you know, it's also um, delightful to be here. I've also were, had the privilege to work with uh, some of the alums and Olympians here from Villanova. Uh, for those of you who may know Jen Rimes and Carrie Tolleson. Um, they are both world-class runners as well as um, individuals, and um, I want to wish both of them luck, and you should do the same thing as uh, they go for another quest to make the 2012 Olympic team this summer that will be competing um, in London, and we'll be having our Olympic trials in Eugene, Oregon in June, and they will both be there. So I want to start off by sharing 
the following quote from Maya Angelou. I've learned, and she said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I'll read that again. She says, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So when you hear a talk entitled, The Power of Standing Alone, how does that make you feel? Did it leave you with a feeling of positive or negative energy? Okay, so here's one of the participatory parts of this session. I want you to raise your hand if one or more of these words came to mind when you heard the power of standing alone. Isolation, solidarity, separation from others, desolate, lonesome or lonely, Try forlorn. Any forlorn in there? No, forlorn. Yeah, I don't even use that word anymore. <clears throat> well, the first of one of my truths that I want to share with you today is that at some point in your journey to achieve your goals or to find your passion, you will have an experience or a relationship with one or more of the adjectives that I just mentioned. And second, believe it or not, you can emerge from your experience with one of these adjectives of feeling lonely, you will emerge feeling empowered and energized. Why? Because those experiences can be used as a catalyst to build an arsenal <coughs> of qualities and tools that will define you as a future leader. So I need you to put a pin right there and I'm gonna just sort of change up a little bit. Karen mentioned that I competed in college <coughs> as an international world-class hurdler in the late 70s and throughout the 80s. I know most of you weren't even born then, okay? <laughs> and in the sport of track and field, you compete as an individual. And most of us have a signature event. Mine was the 100 meter hurdles. And other than competing as a member of a national relay team, track and field is not considered a team sport. In my sport, your performance the end result of your race falls squarely in your lap. As a hurdler, I didn't have the luxury of blaming the quarterback, the goalie, the power forward, the pitcher, or in Gazelle Bungeon's case, blame the wide receiver for their defeat. <laughs> At the end of the day, I had to man up. If I didn't win, I had to accept total responsibility for that defeat. And the same responsibility was there if I, there were praises after I ran a race. But when I stepped up to the starting line or into the blocks, I technically was all by myself. There was no coach to hold my hand, no teammate to help me set my blocks or to jump over a hurdle for me. I was all alone. I was all by myself. Okay, now that I sort of teed that up, let's go back to where I just stopped. So here is where the power of being alone can be so awesomely beneficial as you invest in your own life experiences to become a future change leader. For many, speaking in front of a crowd can be crippling. Some people it can be paralyzing. You forget what you say and it just drives you crazy. So fear can become a barrier. It is no different from experiencing or performing on the track. Okay, did I do that right? You can still hear me? Okay. In order for me to get on that starting line, I had to build up a high level of confidence. I had to learn the value of preparation and discipline. I had to train to be focused and self-motivated. Now, one of the things that Karen, another little side note, Karen didn't mention to you that I did tell her was when I did call my dad when I was a freshman and said I wanted to come home that I hated my coach and I didn't want the scholarship anymore. What she really didn't tell you was that I'm a drama queen. And so I was going through this whole, just whole drama scenario of crying and slobbering and snobbing. Oh, this was all over the telephone. And one of the things that I finally noticed after about 10 minutes of this performance 
that my dad wasn't saying anything. And so, yes, he did basically tell me that you're not a quitter. And he said that, you know, you basically um, need to hang in there. But what she didn't share with you was that after he said that, he asked me, are you finished? And I said, yes. And then the next thing I heard was click. <laughs> and so at that point, I knew I couldn't go home, okay? There was no more about being a quitter or not. I wasn't going home or I had nowhere to go to. So what I'm saying here is that Again, in order for me to get on the starting line, I had to learn to build up a high level of confidence. And that was sort of one of my first tests of doing that. I had to learn the value of preparation and discipline, and I had to train to be focused and self-motivated. My athletic preparation and experiences helped me to build an arsenal of leadership attributes and tools that I use today in both personal and my professional life. I am a firm believer that my athletic training prepared me for leadership, and taught me the meaning of courage. So let's take a look at those attributes and tools. First, courage. This is about having the ability to face your fears straight on. Right? Face them straight on. You can't be afraid to fail or to take chances. As they say, ships are safest in the harbor, but they are not made for the harbor. A second tool is building confidence. If it were not for dedication to fierce preparation, I couldn't have stepped up to compete on the Olympic and world stage. Building confidence happens as a result of doing something, like doing something for hours or days or weeks or even years of constant work and development. Building confidence just doesn't happen overnight. The next quality in the arsenal is character building. And while character develops over time, it is believed that person's observable, a person's observable behavior is an indication of her character. This behavior can be strong or weak, good or bad. A person with strong character shows drive, energy, determination, self-discipline, willpower, and guts. She sees what she wants and she goes after it. On the other hand, a person with weak character has traits of being disorganized, vacillates, and is inconsistent. And the final quality I acquired for my arsenal is being fiercely disciplined. If you want to reach a goal, leaders know you have to be known as a person who maintains a single-minded, laser-like vision and focus. Now, while all of this does sound real good, in the real world, teamwork also matters if you want to be successful. And whether you are in the workplace or amongst your campus community or even on the basketball court, effective teamwork can produce incredible results. Teamwork is about working toward a common goal, and every person subordinates his <coughs> or her individual interest. Now, the third of the truths that I want to share and this is where Karen says I'm sometimes brutally honest, I will have to admit that while I highly recommend and value the attributes that I've gained from the power of standing alone, I am still working on perfecting the teamwork or the partnership skill set. See, I'm still, I'm working now on my third husband. And you know, marriage equals partnership. You guys can laugh, it's okay. And I admit, that I'm still trying to master this one. And so I advise you not to take my lead as it relates to um, uh, this whole issue of teamwork. However, I'm told that the third time is a charm. So I want you all to wish me luck. And, and anyway, I'm sorry for digressing, but, but the most critical quality here that I want to emphasize today as I speak about the power of standing alone and leadership is courage. Courage, as I mentioned, is about facing your fears with self-possession, confidence, and resolution. I truly believe that my leadership roles and accomplishments are the direct result of understanding the power of having courage. The real test of leadership is maintaining your convictions during change and upheaval. As a leader, my day-to-day -day decisions and actions 
communicate volumes and my positions on key issues. When I ran for public office and became a member of the Columbus Board of Education about 10 years ago, I believed and still believe that all children, no matter their socioeconomic status or color of their skin, deserve a first class education. I was a leader of the board and my convictions regarding having first class education also included making sure that those children had new and or improved state of the art buildings and classrooms <coughs> that could support and promote learning. Who wants to learn in 40 and 50 year old buildings that don't even have science equipment or the capacity to build modern computer labs? That's not how you have a first class education. So in my mind, a $500 million facilities program was worth fighting the business community over. Now you have to understand that in my community, the Columbus City Schools is the largest public schools district in the state of Ohio. And its governing body had lost its credibility with the community when I had joined. So as president, one of my first mandates was to build, rebuild trust and confidence in hopes that the community would support our future needs to grow and improve the district. After the first few years, we did begin to change perceptions and made progress in changing the board's reputation. But there was still pushback from the city power influences and thought leaders, and I was told, no, you can't raise that kind of money to build new schools. However, what they didn't realize is that what turns me off most is when someone starts telling me what can't be done. Now, as I pushed forward, I'm sure you are asking the question, was my job and my future political and professional career and reputation in jeopardy for defying the power brokers and taking this stand? Well, of course, yes, it was, absolutely. But what many didn't anticipate is that my athletic training had prepared me for this test of standing alone. So I'll share a quick, another quick story with you. As an athlete at The Ohio State University, I was the first female to be awarded a full track and field athletic scholarship in the history of the university. And that was back in the dark ages, back in 1976 to you all. And that's when Title IX first went into effect. Who knows what Title IX is all about? Ooh, I'm impressed. Ooh, I'm impressed there. And so I came to college as a gifted athlete. And we all know that when you have a gift that others aspire to have, many times resentment and jealousy are usually lurking around the corner. <coughs> Excuse me. As my gift developed, which began to set me apart from the crowd, I became alienated from my teammates. The invitations to hang out became less frequent, and I had to quickly make choices of what was important. Did I need to continue to strive for excellence, to reach my goal to become an Olympian, or was I going to choose to embrace mediocrity so that I wouldn't be rejected by my teammates? Well, I'm sure you know which path I took. So going back to the school board story, during this controversial issue that I took on to build new schools, I became somewhat of a polarizing figure amongst many in the general community and the business community who didn't have the confidence in the school board to manage the funds, nor were they of the opinion that all children had the right to an excellent education. But guess what? For me, this was about competition and I hate to lose. I prepared for the fight with a solid proposal for how we would work with the business community to oversee and manage all of those funds. And yes, because of collaboration and inclusion, we passed the levy and almost six years later, the building program is almost complete and the district's test scores have improved. But the most important highlight about this story is that while many in the community didn't and some still don't agree with my position on public education, I can proudly say they never doubted the courage of my conviction. I am a true believer that courage to honor your convictions 
through change, both small and large, will be the, lead, will be the measure of your leadership. Remember Muhammad Ali, who risked his entire career and arguably lost years of his prime by taking a stand against the Vietnam War based on his religious beliefs? He lost his boxing license. He lost his title and livelihood for his political stand, and for three long years, he couldn't, as he used to say, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. And for all you young people, that used to be one of his branded slogans that ultimately um, was something that was used in the sports arena for many, many years. But later, the Supreme Court overturned, Supreme Court overturned his conviction for, for refusing the draft. Again, there were many who didn't agree with his position on the war, but they never doubted the courage of his convictions. And the power of him standing alone became his brand as a leader and boxing icon. Another example of courage for the modern pop era, okay, you guys are probably more in tune to this one, is that the recent decision made by model Kylie, is it Pasuti? You know who she is? The Victoria's Secret model, who recently quit modeling her modeling career to honor her husband. And while the, while the entertainment world is shocked and most models dream of landing a spot on the Victoria's Secret fashion runway, however, her life priorities changed and she had the courage to stand by her convictions, which is sometimes not a popular move. I have found during my journey that leadership creates a certain separation from one's peers. The separation comes from carrying responsibility that you can only carry. I have also found that the price of leadership is loneliness, and the price of being loyal to your principles is loneliness. It is unavoidable. For those of you who read the Bible, you know that Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, was a man who walked in loneliness. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is quoted as saying, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And those who practice Christianity will say that Christ, who was nailed to the cross to carry the sins of the world, was the greatest, most powerful figure of time and eternity. Or how about we reflect on a quote about courage from activist Susan B. Anthony. She said, cautious, careful people, always casting about to preserve their reputation and social standing, never can bring about a reform. Those who are really in earnest must be willing to be anything or nothing in the world's estimation and publicly and privately in season and out avow their sympathy with despised and persecuted ideas and their advocates and bear the consequences. My intent today is to showcase the upside of the power of standing alone. For those of you who have the passion about achieving excellence and aspire to be future leaders, my hope is that you leave today realizing that power is a positive force if it can be used for positive purposes. My objective for this talk was to provide some insights for how you can develop self-confidence to overcome the things you fear because self-confidence is one of the keys to success. One of my role models and true American heroes, Jesse Owens once said, we all have dreams, but in order to make dreams come into reality, it takes an awful lot of determination, dedication, and self-discipline and effort. Even today, I have mad admiration for this man who came back to the United States after winning four Olympic gold medals at the 1936 Olympic Games in front of a defiant Adolf Hitler, who had the courage and the perseverance to stand alone through the adversity of racial segregation in his own country, and then to add salt to the wound, was totally humiliated by the government and was not allowed to join the other US Olympic team members 
at the White House to shake hands with the president. I can't imagine how he was able to maintain his courage and integrity or how he stayed convicted to his principles. What is more astonishing and inspirational is how he kept his dream alive. So I showcase his journey because the power of him standing alone made him an influential human being. And he was later recognized for his resolve. He was later named as a US Goodwill Ambassador, traveling the world. And in 1976, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Gerald Ford. And later, he was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor by President George Bush. I share this story about Jesse because he was a remarkable example of how courage and the power to stand alone can be the sparkle that turns dreams into reality. Before I close and open the floor to questions, I want to offer a challenge to each of you. I've read your school's annual report, and in doing so, I learned that Villanova University, that the Villanova University experience is rooted in Augustinian values and through an education in social justice, your director at the Center of Peace and Justice Education is quoted as asking students the following, how can you affect bigger change than just handing out soup, soup each week at the soup kitchen? I found this interesting. And based on what I shared with you today, I now challenge you to take, take it one step further. Once you ask and find out what the real issues and reasons are for why a person has to go to the soup kitchen, will you have the courage needed? Would you use your intellectual gifts to possibly stand alone to tackle the barriers and the complexities of why a person needs the support of a soup kitchen? Do you have the courage to be a Jesse Owens? Can you accept the responsibility of being a true leader? I will now close with a writing that's entitled Living a Life That Matters. And in this, it's a little lengthy, but it really sort of exemplifies a lot of what I was trying to share with you today. Ready or not, someday it will all come to an end. There will be no more sunrises, no minutes, hours, or days. All the things we collected, whether treasured or forgotten, will pass on to someone else. Our wealth, fame, and temporal power will shrivel to irrelevance. It will not matter what we owned or what we were owed. Our grudges, resentments, frustrations, and jealousies will finally disappear. So too, our hope, ambitions, plans, and to-do lists will expire. The wins and losses that seemed so important will fade away. It won't matter whether we came from, where we came from, or what side of the tracks we lived on at the end. It won't matter whether we are more beautiful or brilliant. Even our gender and skin color will be irrelevant. So what will matter? How will the values of your days be measured? What will matter is not what we brought, but what we built, not what we got, but what we gave. What will matter is not our success, but our significance. What will matter is what we learned, as well as what we taught. What will matter is every act of integrity, compassion, courage, or sacrifice that enriched, empowered, and encouraged others to emulate our example. What will matter is not our competence, but our character. What will matter is not how many people we knew, but how many felt good when you were around us and how we served them. What will matter is not our memories, but the memories that lie in those who loved us. What will matter is how long we will be remembered, by whom and for what. Living a life that matters 
doesn't happen by accident. It's not a matter of circumstance, but of choice. I'm not sure how I made you feel today, but my hope was to leave you with some food for thought that may be useful as you continue your self-discovery to achieve excellence. Thank you. And now I was told that um, the floor is open for questions. And um, if you want to use the microphone to ask your question or speak loudly. Um, thank you for your talk. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Ariel Benjamin. I'm a graduate student in sustainable engineering here at Villanova. Um, my question is what, besides the word no, motivates you to, you know, keep striving because I have a lot of barriers up against me and I get no's, but at the end of the day, sometimes that's not enough. So what else propels you forward? You know what, being true to myself and, and trusting who I am also keeps me motivated. Um, and, you know, being a woman and being, I think, an African-American woman, you know, we have many people um, on whose shoulders we stand, and I think we have a responsibility not to accept no because they didn't accept no. And that's how I keep myself motivated, knowing that there were people before me who made a lot of sacrifices, um, and that's part of that motivation. So, yeah, when those barriers do sort of pop up, um, always remember that there were a lot of people who had bigger barriers than what we had. Um, and when I look back on some of the barriers that come my way these days, I'm thinking, eh, that's nothing compared to what other folks had. Um, one of my heroes is Sojourner Truth. And you think about what she had to deal with, you know, and what we're dealing with. That's a piece of cake. Yes. Could, could you talk a little bit about the, the, the kind of work that you do um, as, the, as the president of the Track and Field Association? And sort of um, some of the, some of maybe the walls that you um, run into or maybe some of the barriers that you, still, that you are still finding yourself having. Sure. Um, as chairman and president of USA Track and Field, which is the governing body for the sport in this country, um, you know, being a woman in that position um, is the first barrier. You know, sports in this country is still predominantly, you know, dominated by, by men. And so, especially at the international level, um, you know, there aren't, they have an international council of track and field that has about um, 100 and probably 20 something members from all across the world. And there are probably only 20 women who represent their countries internationally on this council. And even still today, there are no women that sit in the officer's positions of our International Track and Field Federation. Um, so there are still those barriers that, you know, they have to put legislation in place to be able to get the numbers up, even though they say that they are committed to diversity and to women in our sport, um, we're still not in positions, decision-making positions at the international level. And when you still look across the board, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, um, you know, when you look at the sport of track and field in this country and even women's sports in this country, you know, what we're finding now that because women are more competitive, that, you know, it's, it's, it's no longer taboo to be a women's coach you know, at the collegiate level. What we're finding, especially in track and field, is that those positions that were once held by female coaches are now being taken by men coaches. Men are now moving over. Now the thing, the question that I ask, and I raised it, you know, to the athletic director at The Ohio State University, you know, there's no women coaches in Division I basketball, men's basketball, so why is it just, you know, something that you can just come in and take the women's positions in women's basketball. And that was because about 
probably about seven or eight years ago, for the first time ever, um, we um, appointed a man to be the head coach for the women's basketball team at the Ohio State University. And, you know, he's a great coach, don't get me wrong, you know, but, you know, we had a long tradition of that. And so when that finally happened, you know, it just shook us a little bit. So, so still in the sports arena, um, you know, challenges such as, you know, the, de the decisions that I have to make, and I'll just share, you know, a quick story. Um, one, one of the things that if you haven't done your homework or know a little bit about me is that um, in 1984, I was uh, picked to win uh, the gold medal at the games in Los Angeles. I had made the 1980 team, but that was a boycott due to um, the war in Afghanistan. And so we didn't get to go in 1980. And so 1984 was my next shot at making an Olympic team. And in the sport of track and field, um, we have one Olympic trial every four years, and you have to be one, two, or three when you come across that line at the final at the Olympic trial. Okay, so I'm gonna sort of give you, tee this up for you. So in 1984, leading up to the Olympic trials, I was ranked number one in the world, indoors and outdoors. I had the fastest running time in the world in the 100 meter hurdles. Um, I was selected by Sports Illustrated, by all, whatever, anybody who knew anything about track and field. I was to be the gold medal winner in Los Angeles. And on the night of our, um, our Olympic trials final, for whatever reason, um, I didn't make it across that line in, third, in first, second, or third place. It was the, it was the closest ever um, three-way tie that they ever have had in Olymp an Olympic trials. And so the thing that really was more upsetting to me was that when you couldn't make a decision that it wasn't that definitive, there was no one there, no women there that had the power to have us run that race over again. And so consequently, I ended up with the alternate spot at the 1984 games, okay? The alternate means you don't get to run. The alternate means you sit around, and I know this sounds horrible, but you sit around and you hope that one, two, or three gets hurt before <laughs> the game starts. It is, that's what you do, you know? You, you pray that they get hurt so that you can run. Um, and two weeks later, I ran all three of them at a race, um, I think it was somewhere in Europe, and basically annihilated the field again, you know, because I was so dominant that year. All right, so let's fast forward 20 years later. So I am now the chairman of women's track and field in the United States, meaning I have responsibility over all women's track and field. And so we're at the um, Olympic trials in Sacramento, getting ready to tee up the 2004 Olympic team. And it just so happened we get to the hurdle race, okay, which is my signature event. And they're uh, running, getting ready to run the semifinals. And there are three heats of the semifinals. And so, for whatever reason, in the second heat, first heat lined up and they ran. The starters and the officials lined up the second heat. And they got ready to get in their blocks, got in their blocks, and one of the competitors uh, jumped, basically, false started, okay? <clears throat> now, for whatever reason, we don't know what happened that day, but the officials did not shoot the second gun to call them back until the fifth hurdle. So anybody that knows about hurdling, you've now run five hurdles at full speed, an Olympic trial semifinal, I mean, this is probably the most intense time that you can ever be in a race, and they waited until the fifth hurdle to call them back, all right? So instead of the officials pulling up the third heat to give these ladies time to recover, he put them back in their blocks, okay? I see the track people's like, mm -mm, yes, they did, yes, they did, okay? Put them back in the blocks. So when the race was finished, one of the ladies who was picked and should, what had been some picked to possibly be in the top three, ended up not making the final. 
Now the track in Sacramento had nine lanes, but we only used eight lanes. Um, and so I knew I had a ninth lane. So I sent a message very quietly to her coach that she needed to protest based upon what had happened um, in that race. And so they protested, and so when it came back to me, I knew this was my opportunity to make a difference based upon what had happened to me 20 years earlier. And so now I gotta fight NBC because, Sport Network, because the where their cameras were angled, they didn't want to have to run all nine lanes. Now they have to reconfigure their cameras to get sure that if whoever, because when you draw the lanes, it's a random draw. So you don't know if four, five, six, or seven, or eight, or the ninth person, they could be in any lane. And they could, the winning person could be, in lane, could be in lane nine, or could be in lane one, as opposed to in the middle of the track. So now ensues this big argument with NBC. Until finally, I just had to be real ugly, um, be like man ugly. <laughs> don't let women understand, you know what I'm saying. To finally say, I really don't give a damn about your camera because first and foremost, this is about someone's life's dreams that we're messing with here. And I wanna make sure that she gets an opportunity to compete on that track and she will compete and we will have nine lanes that we will use. And so I don't care, you have a half hour to figure out how to move your camera and to call Peter Diamond up in that, uh, in that booth and tell everybody what's gonna happen, but there will be nine lanes used in this final for the Olympic trials. Now, this athlete went on to only, um, and she ended up with the alternate spot, the fourth place. But it was my responsibility to make sure that she had the opportunity to run. And so to your point, those are some of the sort of the barriers and still some of the obstacles that I wrestle with and deal with. Um, and then, you know, when you go to the Olympic Games, it's just high drama anyway. So getting ready for those. And so we're getting ready for high drama right now um, in Eugene, Oregon with our athletes. And so that's on a daily basis um, that we deal with that. But I love every bit of it. It's, it's fun. and. Because of my experiences in the past, I think I bring something to the table that most people in my spot never brought because they weren't an elite athlete, they weren't a world-class athlete. And so I am the first athlete to be the chairman and president of the organization. There's always been just volunteers or administrators, but having an athlete there who really understands that we're there because of the athletes and keep an athlete, keeping it as an athlete-centered sports, it does make a difference, um, I think, in my leadership. Yes, ma'am. Could you talk about your coach um, during your college years? Because you kind of alluded to how you did not see eye to eye with him and how you kind of overcame that. Okay, so I have one clarification, and I'm sorry, Ken, I didn't tell you. It was a woman, it oh, wasn't a man. Oh, sorry. Um, and um, we had a love hate relationship. Um, and um, it wasn't probably until about 20 years ago. <laughs> That, you know, we've always really been, I mean, in a way we've been friends, but, <clears throat> you know, here's, here's the difference that was sort of the, this was a different kind of situation. I was recruited by the institution first before I knew who my coach was going to be. So like most of you who are athletes that are coming into it, you, you know now who your coach is going to be. In this instance, they hadn't selected the coach yet. So um, now, the benefit was I had an Olympic Hurdle, hurdler who was coming in as a coach. My signature event, my specialty event. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better match. Okay, her name was Mamie Rollins. But she was a Tennessee Tiger Bell. And so one of the reasons why I really didn't like her was because my dream was to be the next Wilma Rudolph when I was running. And at that time, Mr. Temple told me that I was too slow to be a Tennessee Tiger Bell. And so I resented anybody who had the Tennessee Tiger Bell label attached to them at that time. So here she is, a former Tennessee Tiger Bell. Now she's my coach. So it sort of just started off being sort of ugly. <clears throat> but then at the same time, I was a prima donna. 
And so I didn't have to really train in high school. You know, as I told you, I came to college with a gift, um, a gift that I really didn't appreciate at the time, but I had a gift. And so now all of a sudden I have this woman who's making me run cross country. I don't run cross country, what is that? I never, I don't do cross country. Um, or she's making me run mileage, you know, on a daily basis. And she's doing things that at that time I really didn't understand were helping me to get me ready to make an Olympic team and to become, you know, a world and American record holder. Um, and so it, it was a love-hate relationship, but what she finally figured out with our relationship that the best way to motivate me was to tell me what I couldn't do. And it took her a while, it took her probably about a year, but she would do stuff like, she'd put the workout on the board, and it would be something ridiculous. And um, she'd say, oh, I know you can't do that, so you know I'm not gonna even argue with you today. And so that immediately, I didn't really realize it at the time, was like, oh, now I can't do it, huh? Okay, well, let me show you. And so that was sort of the relationship that we had, um, which helped me move towards being more self-directed and self-motivated down the road. But I have to admit, when I first started, I wasn't as self-directed and motivated as I should be. So if you're not, it takes time. Don't be, don't be ashamed. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. So uh, I'm going to apologize for bringing up an unsavory subject, which is performance enhancing drugs in track, field, and other sports. But um, there's an amazing athlete who I have admired from the first time I saw her run on a track, named Marion Jones, who is the only person who has ever done any jail time in connection to any of the inquiries and investigations that have gone on about who did what, when, and where. And I just always thought that that was such a crime that the only person that they ever singled out and actually sent to jail was a single mother, African American. <laughs> and she tried to make a comeback, and I was amazed. You know, she re I thought she showed an amazing amount of courage coming back on the track and trying to get her career going again. But anyway, I don't know. What are your I don't know. That probably is a totally undirected. <laughs> no, it, it comes up, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to assume that you that my mother planted you here and that you and her, that you and she <laughs> had this conversation because she and I debate this, that the subject of Marion Jones on a daily basis um, still. She is enamored with Marion as well. And, and, and here's why I'm not so much. Um, first, you have to understand that I was the team leader in 2004 when the relay team dropped the baton and she was going to anchor that relay. And I, because of all of the, the, the rumors and innuendo, I sat Marion down with the head coach at that time, Sue Humphrey, and we sat her in a room and I asked her to her face, do I have anything to worry about? And this is why, what people don't realize is that one of the things that we're still fighting right now is the fact that there are three other women who, if you run on a relay team or men, run on a relay team with them, and she did um, in two, what was that, 2000, or oh, what was it, 2000? In 2000, <clears throat> those women, because of her, the admittance of what happened with her at CJ, <clears throat> those women have to give their medals back too. What happens, what people don't realize is one person, whoever, if, if, if one of those people on your relay team tests positive, that contaminates the whole team. And so what you're doing when you step on the, when you do it as an individual, it's one thing, okay? When you do it as being an independent contractor out there, like I said, that's one thing. But when you jeopardize three other people who have worked just as hard as you have, 
um, and their reputations now become in question. And what folks don't realize is they go into history books and they wipe that stuff clean. There's nothing in there that has Marion Jones's name on it. And those three people that were with her, their names are wiped clean. And these are people who they've made their living off of this Olympic accomplishment, okay, some still today. And so I'm still, you know, right now, um, there is, you know, in the court of arbitration, we have athletes who are fighting not to have to give their medals back. And you know what? I refuse as a chairman and president to tell them to give the medals back because in my mind, they deserve to have those medals. So I saw that, so <clears throat> I asked her point blank to her face, did I have something to worry about? And she told me no. And so I have a real hard time with people don't, that don't have a level of integrity that you need to have in those kinds of situations. And I know we all make mistakes, and I'm, you know, I know that, that we all make mistakes, don't get me wrong. But again, when you jeopardize someone else's livelihood, then for me, it takes on a whole nother deal. And so I am not as sympathetic with Marion as probably you and my mother are. Um, and she did lie to a grand jury that's called perjury. Anybody else who does that, they go to jail. You know, I'm, so she's I'm no different. I'm not sympathetic with her for that. I, I just feel like somehow or other she managed to get singled out. I, I mean, I don't, I mean, I think that, that, well, she that, do that I think what she did is wrong. I just, and I don't, I don't necessarily think any of them should go to jail. I think that there are other things that you do, like having uh, bands and things like that. Oh, I think they should go to jail. You know why? Because why they ruin only our her? sport. Why, why only her? <laughs> Well, because, I mean, she hasn't been put, I mean, she was one of your more, more notable athletes. I mean, you have to look at, I mean, if Bolt does something like that, he will probably go to jail too. Well, maybe not in Jamaica. <coughs> <coughs> uh, but if he came someplace else. Um, but because of their fame and notoriety and what they represented and the hundreds of millions of dollars that sponsors um, and, 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 and the commercial community and businesses put into the sport, um, you know, what it does is, you know, one of the things that we're going to wrestle with, you know, in June is though, are those individuals or athletes who are coming back from bands and whether or not they're clean or not. And what that does is it dilutes the accomplishments of those athletes that are there at those trials. Because everybody now, all they want to talk about is drugs, drugs, drugs. I mean, the reality is, is, is that now, to your point about the African Americans being sort of her being singled out. That is one of the problems that I do have and it continues to show the level of racism that still exists in this country. You know, when you look at baseball, when you look at, you know, look at football, when you look at some of the other sports, you know, where drug use is, you know, is very prevalent. Why is it that the sport where 95% of the medals are coming from your minorities are all race highlighted. And we're not even on the same platform as those professional sports, but when you always look up, it's always talking about track and field, track and field, track and field athletes and drugs. So, um, yeah, I mean, th 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 there is this sort of injustice that is going on when it comes to track and field and the whole issue of sports, you know, of, of, of performance enhancing drugs. How we fix it, I don't know, but when you are sort of the signature sport at the Olympic Games, I guess that just comes with the territory. Because at the end of the day, you know, those last 10 days, you know, first you're glued to swimming, then you get glued to gymnastics, and then that last bit, everybody stays glued to the TV for track and field. And then the ultimate piece is, as you know, that relay, you know? And then that's usually when all hell breaks loose in the village. <laughs> and you want to kill somebody because who's going to run those legs in the relay you know, are usually um, the biggest decision where people don't realize that we have to make um, because it becomes so controversial. And because it's a symbol of, you know, pride, you know, for this country and, and you know, it gets to be real competitive. And, you know, I don't even know this time, my husband is, 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 is British. And um, so, you know, we probably, I was Cameron and my son, we were talking at lunch today, you know, we're probably gonna have to get two hotel rooms while we're there because, <laughs> You know, last time the British team 
beat us in the men's four by one, and so we're probably gonna have to get two two hotel rooms while we're there in London because we probably won't be able to stand each other because um, there'll be too much competition going on, you know, during the relay time. Yes, ma'am. Do you still ride? <laughs> I have to treadmill and elliptical. I have to admit I am lazy. I have gotten lazy after I hit 50. I am real lazy. And, um, but, but just so you know, um, uh, Sharon, I don't know if I did tell you, Karen. So um, my husband decided at Christmas he was going to stop drinking. And so we only get to see each other because he's involved in the Olympics and, and track and field in commercial track and field in, in Great Britain. And so, so we go usually once a month and we see each other. So I saw him last week in Boston and he lost 25 pounds because he's running again. He's a bronze medalist in the 5,000 meters in the 72 Olympics. And so now we're in competition mode again. So <laughs> if you bring me back next year, I'll probably, hopefully I've lost 25 pounds or more because now I've got to compete. I got to catch up. I basically got to catch up with him. So, and the only way I'm going to lose that kind of weight that fast is I got to run. <laughs> yes. A source of what, sweetie? Corporatization. You know what? Um, I, I, I think that, you know, uh, especially for, for our sport, you know, having those fo folks who are leisurely competing um, in, in the track or, or, or in road races or in some kind of running, I think is important. I mean, from a health perspective, you know, sports is, is important. And, and I will say, you know, I know there are a lot of men and young men in this room, but for women in particular, you know, I think sports becomes and can be a lifesaver for, for young girls and young women. And so to be able to participate, you know, helps you to build the level of confidence that I know a lot of us are lacking. Um, and, you know, it, it also helps us to become more disciplined. And that whole thing about team is important too, because you know when you get into, as I said, in a, in a work environment, and even here in your campus community, you know, teamwork is important. And the way you learn that is through, a lot of times, is through sports. So um, I am a strong proponent um, for anyone, whether it be recreational um, or if it's competitively, um, you know, at a collegiate level, to get involved and be engaged in sport. Um, and it just, it just, you know, it crosses all kind of barriers and lines and it just, it opens up a whole new world for you. And then, like I said, from a health perspective, I mean, what else? The staying fit, staying healthy, you know, Hopefully it helps you live another 20 or 30 years. Okay, I think that we're sort of out of time. Well, thank you. This was fun. <laughs> <laughs>